Luke's Gospel chapter 8. Uh, we're going to read verses 40 through 56. So you can go ahead and turn there now and just kind of hang out there for a little bit and we'll come right back to it. We are in Capernaum. It's a very important place as it relates to the Savior's public ministry. Jesus lived here. He made this sort of his headquarters, this uh, partly reconstructed synagogue to my right uh, was built on the foundations of the very one that is believed to be the one that Jesus frequently preached in, but over here. Uh, one of the sermons that he preached was known as the Bread of Life Sermon, and it's recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 22 through 59. I don't know if you noticed when you walked in, the trees kind of cover it, but <laughs> see this spaceship over here, this building? <laughs> Looks like a spaceship. Uh, it's built over what many believe was actually the home of Peter, where Peter lived. Um, after the wilderness temptation, Jesus chose Choge, easy for me to say, Capernaum as his home, even his headquarters. We're told that in Matthew 4.13, it says, Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. It was here in Capernaum that Jesus called Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew. It's also where Jesus had them catch so many fish that it broke their nets and almost sunk their boat. It's kind of a humorous account in Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. In Capernaum, this is interesting, Jesus did more healings here than at any other place. A demoniac was healed in Mark 1. Peter's mother-in-law was healed in Matthew 8, which, by the way, means that Peter was married because he had a mother-in-law. I'll just leave it at that. The centurion's servant was healed in Matthew 8. A paralytic was healed in Mark 2. A blind man was healed, actually more than one, in Matthew 9. And a blind, dumb demoniac was healed in Matthew 12. But... What's really interesting is that this is where Jesus raised from the dead Jairus' 12-year-old daughter, and at the same time, he heals a woman who had an issue of blood for also a period of 12 years. Coincidence? I think not. Enter Luke's Gospel chapter 8. Let's pick it up in verse 40 and follow along as I read. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. There a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, presumably the leader of this synagogue here, came and fell at Jesus' feet pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter a girl of about 12 years was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, if you can imagine that. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him. Notice the interesting details that were given. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked, verse 45. When they all denied it, not me, <laughs> Peter said, I love Peter, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then, verse 47, the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet in the presence of all the people. She told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then verse 48, he said to her, daughter, interesting detail again, your faith has healed you, go in peace. 
while Jesus, verse 49, was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus, this is verse 50, said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, verse 52, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Well, this is an interesting account, isn't it? You have a woman who has this issue of blood for 12 years and you have this girl, an only daughter, an only child that is also 12 years of age. For 12 years, the home of Jairus was filled with joy while the woman's was filled with unspeakable misery. At 12 years, the home of Jairus is filled with tragedy and the woman's is filled with hope. It's a, an amazing contrast. Consider this. You have Jairus the man, and you have the bleeding woman. Notice the contrast. The man fell in front of Jesus' feet. The woman touched behind Jesus' cloak. For the man, the miracle was private. For the woman, the miracle was public. For the man, he was a religious leader. For the woman, unclean as she was, ostracized from society, she is a religious outcast. For the man, the healing is for someone else. For the woman, the healing is for herself. For the man, others laughed at Jesus. And for the woman, she had total faith in Jesus. For the man, Jesus says, tell no one. For the woman, Jesus says, go in peace. For the man, he's openly desperate. And for the woman, she's secretly desperate. For the man, it's knowingly planned. But for the woman, it's unknowingly unplanned. For the man, Jairus, he humbles himself. For the bleeding woman, she is exalted. For the man, they call her Jairus's daughter. And for the woman, Jesus calls her daughter. For the man, he knew about Jesus. For the woman, she knew Jesus. For the man, he had a family. For the woman, she had nobody. For the man, he represents the interpretation and the upholding of the law. For the woman, she was freed from the law. For the man, notice, named and known. We know his name. For the woman, not once are we told what her name is. She's unnamed, unknown. For the man, he interrupts Jesus. For the woman, it's the other way around. Jesus interrupts. For the man, he bowed while pleading. For the woman, she bowed while trembling. For the man, his daughter had died. For the woman, she would have died. And lastly, for the man, he saw and believed. But for the woman, she, by faith, believed. What's the takeaway? Simply this. And you know this verse, the writer of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Is that not what the woman did? Is that not what Jairus did? Can you imagine this woman in the throngs, the crowd, as massive as it was?
as ostracized as she was, this would have taken an unspeakable faith to make her way. If only I can get to Jesus and just by faith touch the hem of his garment, his cloak, I'll be healed. What did she have to do to even get to him? Interesting detail, we're told that the, the crowds were so massive they were crushing people. And yet she was able somehow, by faith, to get to the Lord. And when she does, she is rewarded, healed, for diligently, by faith, seeking Him. One of the things I'm learning is that God cannot resist it when we show and exercise faith. If without faith it's impossible to please God, think about this. Does that mean that when we have faith, we are pleasing to God? Absolutely. If without faith it's impossible to please God, with faith it's possible to please God. And who amongst us doesn't want to please God? We want our lives to be pleasing in the sight of the Lord. The Lord is never more pleased than when we have faith in Him. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this simple lesson, this demonstration of faith, this example of faith. Lord, might we take this with us from this place here in Capernaum and learn from it the importance of faith and how it is that faith pleases you. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.